My guest today is actress Kim Arya Peterson, who was born and raised on the island of Trinidad. Kim moved to New York City, where she started acting, as well as studying environmental engineering at Columbia University. She is going to share her amazing story with us today. Welcome to my show, Kim. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. I was <clears throat> reading all of your information, and I watched your sizzle reel on IMDb, and I was literally blown away. I mean, you are an incredible, ta incredibly talented actress. Aw, thank you, James. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah years, years, and years. <laughs> well, when I was when I was looking at, at your sizzle reel, there, there were some of the things that, that you portrayed as far as, and I say this respectfully, you're a beautiful woman, but, and so I had a, kind of a stereotype, which is totally on me, of, of how certain people would, I would think, would act. And all of a said you pulled out this emotion that I was like whoa I did not see that coming it was so <laughs> visceral and so powerful it immediately just moved me into wow this this person is amazing so once again congratulations oh, thank you. I, I appreciate that thank you yeah <laughs> so you were born in Trinidad uh, what yes. was your how did you know that you wanted to become an actress I didn't know that I wanted to become an actress. Oh, really? So I was born in Trinidad and um, my family is still there, my mom and my sister. And there was a coup d'etat, which is like a throwover of the government. Oh. And there was kidnappings on the island. Oh, and my mom was like, you need to get out of this yeah. island. So they sent me to the US. Um, and by that time I was able to get my green card and my citizenship. And then I went to school. But I've always been in the arts. My mom is a big... Um, connoisseur of the arts, I guess that's how you say it. Like she yeah. had us in dance and pottery and painting and this and that, but never um, using our voice as uh, the medium to express sure. yourself. I mean, like singing a little bit here and there. So when I got to New York, it was a transition to get to New York, jumped through a few states before I got yeah, there. Yeah, where did you land when you came to America from Trinidad? Well, I landed in Florida. Oh, and okay. Yeah. And then from Florida, um, I have an older sister who left before me. Gotcha. She got a job transfer to Connecticut. So then I oh. followed her to Connecticut. And yeah. then I was like, yeah. what am I doing in Connecticut? <laughs> <laughs> it's very different from Trinidad, I'm sure. <laughs> and then by that time, like as soon as I landed in Connecticut, her job transferred her to Chicago. And I was like, well, I'm not moving to Ch Chicago. And I was really young. So I applied to I actually had no idea what I wanted to do. So mm -hmm. I ended up in a small Jesuit school called Fair. Fairfield University oh, yeah. in in Connecticut. There, it's a little bit more complicated. It sure. went from Yale to Fairfield yeah. University. That's a story for another day. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized like I didn't want to be in Connecticut anymore. Uh -huh. So I applied for a transfer and I got into Columbia University. Wow. And then when I was there, I was like, holy shit. Holy snipers! Yeah. I'm not gonna say. Yeah. It. <laughs> I'm not gonna curse, but I was like, "What do I do now?" Yeah. Like, I just it was such a surprise. So um, I chose. I knew I wanted to. Uh, being born on an island and very environmentally uh -huh. conscious. Again, back to my mom. She's a part of a group called the Sea Warriors, where they oh, wow. protect the turtles against poaching. I was oh, like, I want to do environmental stuff. So. I said, okay, environmental engineering was like one of the categories and I joined that group. I, yeah. So I studied environmental engineering. Because <laughs> I was reading your bio. I'm like, how in the world? Yeah. How do you go from yeah. environmental engineering to being an actress full time? So, <laughs> so then, you know, I had a boyfriend at the time when I was going to school and he goes, you know, when you get upset, you represent every woman on your island. <laughs> you should take an acting class. And that was like the first spark. Yeah. Like that was the first thing. I was like, oh, maybe, maybe I should do take an acting class. So that's kind of how it was very gradual. It was very uh -huh. slow. And then once I finished my schooling, I got a full-time job. And then I started pursuing the acting more heavily. Like I went to a conservatory and oh. then really started training for it and never thought I would pursue it as a career. Mm -hmm. I just kind of enjoyed the process. I always thought the engineering would be my career and I, and I loved it. And then, um, it just became more, I started booking and then mm -hmm. I was like, Oh, this could be, it, then it felt like it was in my grasp and then yeah. I, it became more real. And then I started training even more. And then, mm -hmm. and then the industry is challenging, you know? So some days I'd be like, screw this. I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And I would quit. And then two days later, I'd be back at it. <laughs> back <to> back. <laughs> oh yeah. When we were talking in the pre-call, I was, I was curious because when it comes to auditions, you know, I've, mm -hmm. 
you, people have seen so many things on TV about people who audition, you know, the, the uh, shows like The Voice or American Idol. There, there is that fear, that adrenaline that rushes through people. How does it affect you when you go into an audition? Yeah, so that is real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it, exists. <Right>. <laughs> it exists, and it's very <laughs> profound. And when I first started auditioning, it would consume me yeah. to the point where, like, I would for, like I remember the one the first time I went in for what was it? It was like some procedural, Law and Order or Chicago something, mm -hmm. whatever. And I literally could not remember anything. Oh, no. You would think okay. I've never seen the sides <laughs> in my life. And that was the turning moment for me where I was like, I have to do something about this. I have to learn how to manage yes. like yeah. this. Or and use it and use it because um it can be used constructively mm -hmm. as opposed to destructively. Yeah. Anything, so, yeah, anything can be a, a stumbling block or a stepping stone. It depends on what you do with it. Correct. So yeah. I started um, really practicing my auditions at home and doing audition classes and then connecting that those tingles, those mm -hmm. vibrations and that <clears throat> those nerves mm -hmm. with um, excitement and trying to spin it positive. And then I would tell myself, okay, as soon as I feel these butterflies, I know, okay, that's my cue that I'm going to do a great job. Like I just started oh, to Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. So and you would decouple like, the, yeah, de decouple the fear with something yeah. positive or healthy. And so when you would feel that you retrained or reconditioned yourself to say, this right. is actually a healthy, productive thing I can't wait to do. Right. And then when I, if I didn't feel it, I was like, oh no, this audition's not going to go well. <laughs> but I would always feel it because it's just yeah. there. Yeah. So, um, I started doing that a lot and it took, it was gradual. And then eventually I realized those sensations connect me to my emotional life. Mm -hmm. oh, like okay. it helps open me up a little bit. Uh -huh. So when I have super high stakes scene or, or audition or something like sure. I can somehow you can utilize it to kind of get you into those sensory emotion, emotions mm -hmm. and stuff. Have you ever got so lost in an emotional expression when you're acting that it's hard for you once, once they, once they say end scene or cut, that all of a sudden you're like, oh gosh, I'm still feeling this. I'm still overwhelmed and I, I need a moment, people. <laughs> um, at the beginning, yeah, I, I felt like that. Now I feel like it's, it's just like an on off thing. Okay. Like when they say cut, I'm like, okay, great, we're back. Oh, yeah. Wow, okay. Yeah, so <laughs> That's it's, awesome. it's gotten, um, it's gotten more compartmentalized in my mm. head. Like I'm very well aware that this is just for this scene. This is just yeah. for this character. And this is not identified with Kim. And then once they say cut, okay, I'm done. From a psychological approach, that's very healthy because if we do allow, you know, sometimes people have a sense of empathy, which is a wonderful thing. It can be a blessing or a burden. But sometimes if we empathize with someone that once that person leaves and all of a sudden we are lost in that. So wonderful for you, kudos for you rather, to be able to be able to separate that to say this is the character's emotions, yeah. emotional state. This is not mine. Because when we do lose that identity, then we unfortunately do become that character. And then all right. of a sudden we assimilate that, that emotional output or that emotional struggle. And then now all of a sudden it's us. And I do little things, little rituals. Like, um, I mean, it works for me. I don't know if it, it's something, it's mm -hmm. bizarre. Like, like if I'm in an audition or a scene or I'm doing my work or I'm breaking down a script or something, I'll be like, okay, opening myself up to this character now. And mm -hmm. I literally say that. And then when I'm done, I'm like closing myself down. Oh, okay. to so, this that, so in psychology, now. yeah, that's a rich, that's, yeah. that's a form of a ritual. So when you, when you create something, it allows, like you said, to compartmentalize it, to say, this is this, and this is that, because when you create that ritual in your mind, it literally creates a, a new neural pathway for you to say, this is this specifically, this specific time is for this character. And now mm -hmm. I can step out of it. So you probably didn't realize you're doing all these psychological things, but it's really cool. I had no idea. <laughs> like literally. So now it just, it's just become open and yeah. close like I'd say open and then psychologically I know okay this is my time to play mm. in this world and then close okay I'm done Perfect. that's so healthy <laughs> how do you handle rejection when it comes to auditions that you've that you've had oh yeah there's been so much of that um <laughs> yeah lots of reject rejection in this industry um it was tough at first mm -hmm. but then when you start to, when I started to ask myself, why am I doing this? Um, and I come back to the why it kind of helps with that a lot. Mm -hmm. And then there becomes a point where you just don't care about the rejection yeah. anymore. Like you just kind of, once you've done enough and you've been rejected enough times and you realize it's not personal. Yeah, exactly. Because, yeah. 
because there's like all these, and I've been on the other side of casting things as well. So I see that, oh my God, this actress is so brilliant or this actor is so amazing. But this one is, is a little bit, a little bit rusty, but he's more, there's like so many Mm -hmm. factors that go into, yeah, yeah, like that's so out of your control. All you can do is your best Mm -hmm. and then you just have to forget about it. And if the stars align and you get it, that's great. Mm So rejection was really hard on early in earlier when in my career, because I took personally, but then when I started to um, kind of realize that it's not personal, mm. then I started to, it became more of a healthy path for me. And the rejection takes you on an exploration of self. Like you, you have to start digging deep and realizing, mm-hmm. okay, this is not, this is not about me sure. and stop, stop. Yeah. Making well, it. That so makes, yeah. That makes me think as well as I'm sure. And this is something I think we all can use because we've all been rejected or felt rejected sometime, whether you're an actor or <laughs> in other areas of your life. But if you have that sense of rejection, if you can slow down and pinpoint what what did I really think they were rejecting, and mm-hmm. so if you can if you can say, well, I'm not tall enough, or my hair isn't a certain color, or or I'm overweight, or whatever it is. But if you can identify that, unfortunately, that is perhaps a blind spot that we all have, or whatever whatever it is, because what we're doing is we're taking our own insecurity, and we're projecting it onto that person, and then saying, oh, see, they see this about me, so this must be true. Right. And the reality is, they don't know anything about you. <laughs> they only maybe know just a couple of seconds of seeing you, but if we yeah. automatically think they know all the nuances of us, they know all our history, so therefore we must, it must be true what we already feel about ourselves. And so I think when we're right. aware of that, that we're really just pinpointing our own insecurity about something. And like you said, if it, if it creates that awakening of, well, now that I know that I'm insecure about this, so then let me, like I said earlier, let this be mm-hmm. a stepping stone. Let me fix that. Well, what can I do? So if I feel like I'm overweight, well, then what do I do about that? If I feel like I'm this, what do I do about it? And it puts the mm-hmm. responsibility back on us to self, self-develop. I mean, it gets a little sticky. I mean, what gets to me still is like when you're, when you're on hold for something, whether and it's and you've gone through all of these rounds of auditions, right? Mm-hmm. So this is not like the first one that you've yeah. been rejected, but you've gone through like ten rounds of auditions oh at this gosh. point, and producer sessions, and this and that, and all the other stuff, and then it's down to you and a few other people, and mm-hmm. your heart's just like throughout the days, just waiting to figure out if it's you, and you don't get it. That's a little bit harder of a one to because then it's like, is it my skill? Is it my craft? She looks kind of just like me, so it's not the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's also I think because you have an emotional investment now, because yeah. you put time, per, your own personal time in it. You've 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 thought so much about this that you probably are more emotionally invested in it than you may mm-hmm. realize, which makes perfect sense. So those are the times that I really have to like. It takes me a little. It'll take me a bit to just kind of unwind from mm-hmm. that kind of hurt in a yeah, way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you ever been asked to do something that does not feel like it's part of your personal integrity? Yes. Um, I have been asked. Yeah. And those are tricky because like you don't want to disappoint, especially mm-hmm. as a female and like well, you're one of the billion in the acting industry. Yeah. Um, but then you kind of have to really think of the project, right? And mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> how big is this project? Where is this project going? Who's directing it? Like, let's look at other actors like yourself. Have they ever done anything like this before? And then, and then the final question, would I feel, would I feel good about myself if this was released and everyone saw this? Um, so there was one time I was asked to do something, um, that I was so excited to work with this director. He was up and coming. I knew he was budding. He had a couple shorts that won a bunch of, um, film festivals and stuff like that. And they were looking to get funding for the feature and they did get funding for the feature, but the short, it was like pretty compromising for me. And I, and I ended up making a decision. I said yes at first. And then as I thought about it, I was like, I can't. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I had to go back and I was like, I'm so sorry, but this just, it doesn't, doesn't sit. Doesn't resonate with you. Yeah. 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 And how did, and, uh, well, regardless of this person, but after you did that, what, how did you sit with that, your resolution? Because you, you went back and said something and whether you continued in that role or not, but you have to hold yourself accountable. How did you deal with that? The aftermath of finally making that decision? Um, I mean, I felt some sort of way for a bit, mm-hmm. but then time, time does a lot, right? Like as time goes on, you, you drift further from that thought and then it just becomes like, 
okay, stop beating yourself up, Kim. Yeah, mm-hmm. you you said this, and then you said this, and you went back and forth, and you set people up, and you gave them the expectation that you were going to do it, and then you disappointed them, and all those feelings kind of like subside, which is mm-hmm. another lesson that I've learned that time is always going to heal yeah. everything, all the disappointments, all the rejection. I just need to give myself some time. Yeah, this is very healthy. When now, when you're asked to do things that would potentially compromise, you felt compromised. How do you use that previous lesson to help you make the new the new choice or the new decision? I just like say it out from the get go. Okay. This is what I That's like. If I read, rule. yeah. If there's like a script or something that I'm reading or a scene, well, first of all, I tell my agents and managers if it it's asking for some sort of crazy thing like mm-hmm. nudity and complete nudity and all this kind of stuff like don't submit me yeah. just i think okay. it's better if you don't and my and they're so amazing about that That's like good. they're just like they're great about it so um they just won't submit me for that stuff and then th- if if by happenstance i do get something that says that like I I would just let them know like I'm not comfortable with this mm-hmm. and I just won't even audition for it. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So if yeah. it gets through them, then you'll you'll recognize it yeah. for yourself. With the people listening right now are watching right now, what what advice would you give them when it comes to the media and Hollywood has a certain look that you and a certain aesthetic that you always have to aspire to look a certain way or certain be a certain way. For one, how do you adhere to that but also keep your own individuality and are able to say this is me regardless of some perhaps other people's expectations? Um, I, I think that's kind of in the acting world. I want to say there's a place for everyone oh, in job. the acting world, job. like for every age and for everyone. Yes. There's like the small groups that like the CW channel that's going to want like, right. But I feel like there's like a place for, for everyone in that acting world. And there, there is, you know, um, you know, I had a manager that said, if you're a young, pretty girl, it's going to be a billion times harder for you because there are 10 billion young, pretty girls trying to do this. (laughs) So you have to be, you have to be even sharper in your Mm -hmm. craft. And you have to be even more um, efficient in your approach in the industry, like because there's a billion. Sure. Of, so it's not even about the looks so much anymore. I I get that there's mm-hmm. an aesthetic that I think in the in back in the day it was a little bit stronger. Like it was always the pretty girl or the handsome yeah. guy or yeah. the dapper guy or whatever. But I think it's kind of changed now. I don't really. Good. I feel That's like if you're a type, mm-hmm. you're it's better to be a type than to be the more commercial look. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that does make a lot of sense, which goes back to people really embracing their individuality. And mm-hmm. you can embrace your individuality it creates the confidence and the confidence and translates in your auditions. And I think embrace, I mean, I struggle with, uh, when I said exploration of self earlier, because I struggled with what it is to be authentic. Mm-hmm. I was like, well, I think I'm authentic. I think I am like, but you are raised with all of these ideas and social media. And, um, I remember I had an acting teacher that said you will never work in the industry with your accent. So I went and I learned how to neutralize my accent, Mm -hmm. but then I realized it's kind of what makes me different Mm -hmm. and the places that I can use it and show that off. And, um, it, yeah, it's, it works. It comes back to your, I yeah, like I said, the authenticity yeah. of who you are. You're, yeah, like really, truly, like knowing that my cultural differences and my everything is more than enough, and it it can take me someplace that I don't even think I could get. Yeah. Just because it's different, I'm That's, different. Yeah, yeah exactly, and that, and you can embrace that 100 percent as well. <laughs> awesome. Well, Kim Ari Peterson, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on my show today. Thank you so much. Thank for being you. A thank guest. you. Yes. <laughs> if my listeners want to find out more information about you, where would they find all this information online? Yes. So you can get me on Instagram at Kim Aria Peterson at Kim Aria Peterson. <laughs> and also the same thing for my Facebook. It's Kim Aria Peterson. You just plug the name in and there I am. Awesome. Well, my listeners also know that if they're not able to find this information any other place, simply go to both web- websites at either jamesmillerlifeology.com or lifeology.tv. Kim, thank you so much for being a fantastic guest on my show today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.